ISIS crossed the border and came from the back and massacred actually 150 women and mostly children. It was one of the most horrible happening because it was it was not a war. It was just a butchery. We're talking about hundreds of thousands of people forced to leave this place with no proper accommodation, with no proper human life for them. Why the world did not help us? Why did the world did not take action? Why they did not speak out for us? When September 11 occurred, the whole world was silent. When the London bombings occurred in 2005, the world was once again silent. When the Madrid bombings occurred in 2004, the world was once again silent and remembered all those lives that were taken. When the Paris attack occurred and those 17 lives were taken, three million people marched the streets of Paris for freedom of speech and freedom of religion. In Iraq and Syria, hundreds of children, hundreds of women, thousands are killed. In one month, does the world stop to remember them? Does the world stop to take a moment of silence and remember those souls, those lives that have been taken? We don't, and I think it's time that we do. My name is Richard Campos, 63 years old, Iraqi war veteran, and loving life. I was deployed in 2003, uh, helicopter company, Company G, uh, Stockton, California. My first duty station uh, was in Erbil, actually, Kurdistan. Of course, at that time, uh, none of us knew what a Kurd was, uh, or even for the fact what Kurdistan is. Many people do not know where Kurdistan is. And it's very easy to get Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, uh, Turkmenistan, Kurdistan confused. The Kurdistan region is divided into the, the northern Iraq, which is southern Kurdistan, northern Kurdistan, which is southern Turkey, eastern Kurdistan, which is western Iran, and western Kurdistan, which is north East Syria. After World War I, when the Allies uh, literally carved up the Ottoman Empire, the Kurds not only did not get their state that they had been promised, but they were divided into four countries. And these four countries, Turkey, Iraq, Iran, and Syria, colluded for the mistreatment of the Kurds. They did not want the Kurds to have their own state. They did not want to lose any land to these powerless people. They blame um, their, their problems on the fact that the West created these artificial states after World War I and forced them to live with each other, knowing that these people could not stand to live with each other. In 1991, when we Americans actually encouraged the Kurds to uh, rebel against Saddam Hussein, they did so and then when Saddam attacked them, we were not there for them. We refused to give them help. We watched it happen. I mean, the world watched it happen and nobody offered help to the Kurds. I think morally, that would have been the time to intervene. Uh, probably a better time than 2003. And then there was the, the war of 2003. Whatever your uh, political view is, whether it was a liberation for you or an invasion, what it did was it allowed uh, the borders of Iraq to become vulnerable. And Al-Qaeda found its safe haven within Iraq. Islamist extremism knocked on the door, and doors were wide open for them. I saw on the news, as we all did, the atrocities that ISIS was doing in Iraq.
It was during that time when, of course, we Americans were watching on the news the, the plight, this mass exodus of these Christians and these Yazidis, of these ethnic minorities. Uh, and then we're talking about astronomical numbers. 1.5 to 2 million, depends what, who you listen to. But still, it's just a lot of people. <laughs> They've had to cross over into the Kurdish region of Iraq in order to seek safe haven. What are we going to do with all these people? What is Kurdistan going to do with all these people? What is the international community going to do with these people? These people are displaced. They're not really even refugees, honestly. Because refugees are, are people who, who leave their country and enter another country. These are IDPs, internally displaced people. We've been in Iraq for many years and lost many good people. A lot of money been spent on those wars, Iraq and Afghanistan. So I get that. But morally, we have an obligation to these people, just morally. One Iraqi friend of mine told me, we're waiting here like sitting ducks. We're just here waiting, waiting for a miracle to happen. I just knew I had to do something. So I had to go back. So. I went back again. They're calling Erbil the little Dubai. I mean, it's, it's a thriving capital. The Kurdistan Autonomous Region is where uh, the Kurds actually control their own government, have their own flag, have their own constitution. It's the only really safe haven for the Kurds. Kurdistan is a developing state in its own right. Without these refugees, Kurdistan is struggling to develop and it's growing fast. When I walked into the Ankawa Mall, it looked like they had to leave in a hurry. So here is this temporary safe haven, the Ankawa Mall, and now, again, they're being uprooted and had to leave again. Richard explained to us what it was like when he was there before. I could see where the kids uh, had played and where the kids shouldn't have played and things that would get you thrown in jail here in the United States because of the uh, dangerous conditions of an unfinished mall, but it was a roof over their head. And I think that that was one of the reasons that they had picked this place to house the refugees. There wasn't any place else to put them at the time. And then to see it, it was like a ghost town. It was a very surreal experience. And I just kept hoping, I, I pray that these people are in a better place now. They're in a camp, uh, Ashti camp, which is still in Erbil. And thankfully they have a, a church uh, that's supporting them and helping them out as much as they can. When we heard the word ISIS is very close, and people were so scared, they left with nothing, they left everything behind. By the time we got to Kurdistan, you know, we're talking about a large number of people, huge amount, people waiting in front of the churches. You know, as Christians, the first place we go to is church. That's how we see it's our mother where it embraces us with all means. So people were waiting for the doors to be open for them. Kurdistan, I think, was shot with what happened too when we saw a large number of people coming and there was no capacity for that. After one year, I see that we still living in containers, it's a dining room, it's everything for them. You know, you see there's no privacy between men and women, there's no privacy for the children. And that's how we see like how trauma start getting to people and no opportunities for job because this large number of people is so difficult to find jobs. Each family has a caravan and each caravan has a restroom 
and I believe there's a couple of uh, bedrooms and there's a kitchen, makeshift kitchen in there. There were small prefab buildings, about 10 by 20, that would house families of any size. You could have two people in it or eight people in it living in these unbelievably cramped conditions. The camp that we're running, we serve about 7,000 people around camp, and we serve people who are living in Ankawa and other towns that are close to Ankawa. We receive about 250 patients to 300 per day, so we always have a need for medicine. We have need for equipment. able to uh, play some games with the children. That was really uh, a great feeling. And I'll never forget that. So they still had hope, but I feel that the adults were hopeful. They'd already been displaced at least a couple of times from their homes. Welcome, welcome. If I were in that situation, I wouldn't want to get too comfortable because I would think to myself, how long can this last? How long will we have this? And that's an anxiety that I wouldn't want to have to face every day. I wouldn't want to have to wake up and think, well, when are we going to have to move again? Since the first century in Iraq, we have been known as the builder of cultures. We kind of live with everyone with peace, who lived with Muslims, who lived with Yazidis, who lived with any other minorities, and we never caused problems now to be driven and treated like this, like, what have we done? This is a question, like, have we done anything wrong to deserve that? A lot of these Christians, and uh, Assyrian Christians, are feeling abandoned. A lot of them ask us, what have we done to deserve this? <laughs> and you know, when I talk to them on Skype, and I see the destitute that they're living in, I see women cutting their hair because there isn't any water for them to wash their hair with. I thought, that the church in America would want to hear what their persecuted brothers and sisters are going through. But believe me when I tell you, there were not too many doors that were opened to us. People were afraid, people didn't care, people didn't believe. A lot of Protestant churches told us that, well, Christians of the Middle East are Catholic or Orthodox, they're apostolic churches, they're not born again. They're not real Christians, and we don't want to have anything to do with it. Believe me when I tell you I've heard that over and over again. And yet, these are the true Christians that are living the gospel. they rather die for Jesus Christ than convert to Islam, because very easily they can. They can renounce Him, but they don't. I want to ask help of Christians in all of the world. As a Christians, we need to be everywhere on the earth. We want that. It's a religion for peace, for love. It's a religion helping people to helping other, supporting each other. We need to do more. We are real Christian or not. Real Christian means supporting each other, helping each other. We had made arrangements to meet with uh, this group called the uh, Nineveh Plains Forces. I looked at them and I, as pretty much Christian freedom fighters. They were the Christian groups who were interacting with the Muslim groups, the Peshmergas, in fighting a common enemy. We talked to the commander and he says, no, we're very for real. We have a mission, we have a purpose. We are here to not only help and protect Christians, but also help us and uh, fight side by side with the Peshmergas. Uh, one of the, the commander there, I asked him how many soldiers he had under his command. He said, we have about 330 warriors, but about 110 fighters. I didn't understand what he meant by that, so I asked him for the 
distinction between a warrior and a fighter. And it was very simple. And he said, I only have 110 weapons, so I can only have 110 fighters. What he was saying was, I have men that are willing to fight ISIS, and I can't equip them. There's a definite need for military backing and military weapons so these people can protect their country. We were told that they had a village that they were protecting, and this village had approximately 12,000 population. And now it was totally empty. Which to me is amazing that ISIS had come. That's like a town of the size I live in and just threw everybody out. Either you leave or I kill you. And the uh, Christian militia, along with the Peshmergas, fought them off and retook uh, the village. We walked around in that sanctuary. It was a moment, I think, even for Richard, who's not religious, it was a very, very beautiful moment. I walked into one of the abandoned homes there that had served as an outpost, and I was looking around the room for really any signs of anything, any life, or what kind of person had lived here, and I found on a dresser a crucifix and some uh, Christian uh, paraphernalia, some leaflets of, out of a nearby church and Thank a you. postcard with the Virgin Mary. And it was almost like someone had set them there just for me to find them. ISIS had set up camp in this home. The fact that those little artifacts were sitting there waiting for me um, it was just overwhelming. And I don't, I don't care if you're religious or not, you have to accept the fact that that was just a little ray of hope, just a little bit of light uh, for me to find that there that day. I think that even strengthened his faith as well, even more so. ISIS can do everything in their power to rid the world of the Christian faith. And they can't, they can't succeed. They won't. They won't. We can't let them. The Christian here now, all of them, let's say 90% of them, they don't want to stay in, the, in this. So if we didn't get help, we are not Christian, I think. We, we, we don't deserve to hold this name if we not support each other. Help us to stay or help us to leave. This is what we want. One of the things we wanted to spend our time doing was interviewing people or talking to people who don't have the privilege of being in these camps, who are really trying to make it on their own. I was surprised that there were still families after a year living outside the camps and living in these abandoned buildings and saw families, grandma, husband, wife, children. I was taken aback. <laughs> Zidiism is interesting because it's the only truly ethnic religion in the world. You have to be born into it. You cannot join it. They do not proselytize. It's, a, it's an ethnic religion that only Yazidi people belong to. They're very unique in that regard. The idea that a person could grow up and choose a faith is foreign to Kurdistan. It's foreign to most Muslim countries. They don't have a worldwide community, whereas the Christian faith or the Muslim faith certainly does have an international community. A lot of people don't even know what a Yezidi is. 
they are essentially being hunted to extinction by ISIS. I always felt like I wanted to do something for them. So whenever I would take their picture, I always wanted to share with them the picture I had of them. They seemed to always be fascinated by that. But it was for me somehow healing in that I could at least do something to, to interact. They chased them up the mountain. It was all in the news. There were thousands and thousands of Yazidis up on top of that mountaintop. And they were telling the stories that while they're on the mountaintop, some family members are actually throwing their little ones off. The ones who were sick or couldn't make it, they were actually sacrificing them and throwing some of them off the mountaintop. They were looking for a way to get off this mountain. And a lot of them were unfortunately dying up there. It was so hot, this was August. Well, United States, uh, after probably being pleaded to by the world, sent some forces up to the top of that mountain. And their main purpose, possibly uh, evacuating the Yazidis off of this mountain. They walked around the mountaintop, our forces did for at least an hour or two. They did a survey and they determined that there was a path for the Yazidis to come off this mountaintop. So essentially our forces left. They just left, up and left. Now can you imagine if you're on top of that mountaintop with your family, all of a sudden you hear aircraft coming over and you look up, it's American aircraft. Can you imagine the feeling they felt? We are rescued. That's what I would be thinking. But yet, after a couple of hours of survey, they leave. Now, what will you feel? I feel ashamed. That's what I feel as an American. And someone should ask that question, why? moral compass. Are we not human beings? Aren't we not put here on this earth to help others? I know our group in this documentary is supposed to be their voice. And I know we don't want to fail in that aspect. And we will not fail. We will tell their story. But we also got to ask these tough questions. Where's our leadership? Those families that we interviewed, separate from the camp, had suffered tremendously at the hands of ISIS. They had gone through some horrific, 
horrific things. His grandmother's sitting right across from me, and she just loses it. She just loses it. Her granddaughter comes up and starts consoling her. It took everything in my power not to just come completely apart. I could have lost it right there. forget looking out over a sea of white tents as far as you could see. And in each tent, there's probably 10 people who've lost everything they have. Everything they have is in that tent with them. After the issue of ISIS came here to, to Kurdistan, we received them in this camp. Uh, till now, the number of the people uh, is uh, 14,500 people in this camp. These camps were the most depressing camps we had seen. I know there was going to be a lot of pain, a lot of sadness, a lot of misery, but what we saw was just was beyond that. It took us to one gentleman. Uh, had a broken back. He proceeded to tell us how his back was broken. So they were doing UN drops and air cargo drops with food and water. Unfortunately, they couldn't drop low because ISIS had the ability to shoot them down. So they're flying pretty high. One unfortunately dropped and hit this gentleman's family and himself. <laughs> No one give him any medicine. Okay. Two tons fell on him. More than two tons. It's big. It's like big box of water. Have been parachuted. Fell on his family. So he broke his back and his wife was dead. His wife was killed. And he showed us his X-ray um, reports, medical reports. And I looked at them, and I could clearly see how his spine was completely broken. And I read the medical report from the doctor, and he said this patient needs urgent surgery, but he can't get the surgery in Iraq. He has to leave the country. Stefan, once every week, the medical people, once a month, one. To see him. And he has no papers. He has no documentation. And he has four little children. He had a six month old, and the baby was only a month old when his mother died. <laughs> At some point, I, I felt guilty just listening to the stories. I couldn't give him any, any words of, of encouragement, honestly. What was I going to say? Things will get better? Come on, let's go there. As I was walking away from that tent, I was kind of walking around the back of the tent. And of course, there's tents everywhere. I happened to notice on the string uh, where you would hang clothes and wash them. It was these diapers, these disposable throwaway diapers that you're supposed to throw away. I just want to show you that. They had taken disposable diapers and had been washing them just so they could have something what they believed to be clean uh, that they could put on their babies. And I'm looking at individuals who have nothing. They have absolutely nothing. And 
they're trying to do their very best. to take care of their families. And it's just tragic. We were walking towards the, the tent. We could hear the baby screaming, but it was, it was a loud and horrible scream. I mean, she wasn't just crying, she was screaming. First, I literally thought the baby had been burnt because of the the marks and the the infection on the baby, the skin that was peeling off. The back of the baby's head, she was patches of her hair had fallen off. It turned out we had a doctor with us. It turned out that the baby has a skin condition. And the baby was born with a skin condition. Conditions that she's living in have made it worse for her because she's exposed to dirt, dirty water. She caught an infection on her skin, so it was peeling off and it looked as though she had been burnt. And that was the first time she saw a doctor. I literally thought the baby was six months old. She looked so tiny. The baby is 18 months old. She looked like a newborn almost. And every story seems to get progressively worse and worse and worse. As we're walking around that same camp, they said there's a, a lady in her 70s taking care of a couple of children. So she don't know any news from there. It's only prank. Asking for God to bring the fathers and mother here for the children. This lady was taking care of two children that needed blood transfusion. And she said they have not yet seen a doctor. I'll never forget that. I'll, I'll never forget just the looks in their eyes. As we're walking away, cameras were put away. and We're walking away. She comes standing up at the edge of her tent. And she says something in her language. And I stopped and I asked one of the interpreters, hey, what did she just say? What did she say? She just said that, uh, don't film us if you're not going to do anything about it. After a couple of days of this, I told the crew, I said, you know, I said, I really don't want to go back to another camp. And the reason I said that was because I could see in these kids' eyes and these people's out the adults that, that were there in these camps, they had this look of, uh, is it going to be you? Is it going to be you guys going to help us? You guys are from America. Just by seeing us there, they would immediately just be like, you're going you're gonna to save us, you're going to help us. I started feeling like, the, gosh, I can't really help these people as much as I want to. And their ages, how old are they? A bottle of depression will come in, you know, because you just, you want to help as much as you can, but even the money we brought over as donations was just a, you know, if, if a drop in a bucket, if that. Family here, these are all brothers and sisters, uh, ranging from age, uh, what was the age again? Four. Four, Four all the way up to 30. We said almost 30, 30 years Almost 30 years old. And you have these people squatting together in unsanitary conditions who are suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder, um, what is their future going to look like? You have to remember that many of these are doctors and lawyers and electricians and engineers and professional people. Because the ISIS have uh, received everything from the army of Mosul. When they flee the army, they receive everything from the machine, missiles, uh, cars, everything they need. Right. So right. they can they fight against them. But let me, let me say this then, real quick. Um, Again, there's another tragic story here among the thousands that live here. And if I didn't report it, there's like over a hundred, there's over a hundred thousand men and women and children that live in this particular camp. And this is just one camp 
There's probably how many camps around? More than 30. More than 30 camps similar like this, like this that needs, needs help. And they're finding themselves, you know, in a territory where there's nothing to do in a given day. How are they supposed to live? Losing your home is one thing, but being thrust into a foreign environment with no tools and, and no uh, means of living is adding uh, misery upon misery. I was just taken aback that this is still happening, uh, these unfortunate circumstances. The tents are starting to uh, deteriorate. Uh, they have a shelf life between eight to 10 months. We have heard that the children of these camps are starting to develop scabies, and that's because of the clothing they're wearing. So this has been well over a year, and in a year's time, it's getting worse. Yes, it's getting worse. You're driving out for a while, and it's almost like an apocalyptic wasteland. These roads that have not been maintained since the Saddam era, I'm assuming. It's a small country. And when we were in Erbil, we were really only about 50, 60 miles away from Mosul, Mosul being the headquarters for ISIS. We kept seeing signs where Mosul was getting closer and closer to us. Which was something that uh, was a little nerve wracking when we just thought, well, how close are we gonna go? How close are we going to get to Mosul? So finally, we take an offshoot on the road. We get out to this village, and it's all been taken over by uh, Peshmerga. It's their base. And this is essentially an outpost before you get to the front lines. They are manning the front lines. They're right there, making sure Daesh doesn't advance any further. They had a saying that kept coming back. They talk about standing in front. They stand in front of everybody as Peshmergas. And that phrase kept coming back, standing in front, we're standing in front. This was as close as we were ever going to get to ISIS, basically a little under a kilometer and a half away. You could see ISIS's outpost from our outpost. Now they're fighting a force, ISIS, that is very well equipped. ISIS has weapons that was provided to the Iraqi army by our government. So ISIS is fighting Peshmergas with some of the best weapons in the world. The Peshmergas are using some old antique weapons, but they're doing a hell of a job. Peshmerga are using weapons that look like they're from the Cold War era. A lot of things are very much outdated. And so you have these guys there that are provided anything other than a weapon. They buy their own uniforms. If they have uh, an IBA or a uh, bulletproof vest on, it's something they purchase themselves. Some of them have nicer goggles than the other guy because they're not military issue. They buy them themselves. One guy had a scope on his gun. He bought it himself. They were fighting a war out of their own back pocket without much support. A lot of them are just volunteers. And I mean, not volunteers like American Army volunteer. Volunteers where they don't get paid a dime. And I asked, how how, how do they get the uniforms? They're wearing uniforms. Well, they paid out of their own pocket. Everything's paid out of their own pocket. Even the rounds, even their bullets, it's paid out of their own pocket. None of their shoes matched. But despite all of that, despite the fact that they're ill-equipped, despite the fact that they are lacking the proper tools to fight, they remain completely confident that they can defeat ISIS. I asked them, were they looking for American troops to help them out? And they said, no. We're looking for upgrading our equipment so we can better fight Daesh or ISIL. These Peshmergas are very proud of who they are. They know how to fight ISIS and they're willing to fight ISIS, they're not a problem at all. Why? Because they fight for their country and for their people first. Baghdad is the central government and the Kurdish region run by KRG. 
they're a semi-autonomous government, but Baghdad still rules them. So Baghdad is the central government. So therefore, our government will only deal with the central government, Baghdad. And it's kind of unfortunate uh, because our government is trying to make this Iraqi government work. And I really believe it's because of the great sacrifice that was given to that country. Our treasure spent almost a trillion dollars over there to establish a new government, a new democracy. So our government doesn't want to see that just break apart. They're trying to keep it together and tell them, make it work. It just all of a sudden hit me that I was in a combat zone in Iraq because I knew that it would be important for me because of that mission of standing on the soil where Joey had shed his blood to try to bring some of that soil home. I said, Richard, we're in a combat zone in Iraq. My son died in a combat zone in Iraq. I think this would be appropriate. <laughs> It didn't fully hit me until I leaned down on the ground and I squatted down on the ground and I started filling this bag with dirt. And, uh, and the emotion of it really grabbed me. As dirt was falling through my fingers, Iraqi soil, dirt that Joey fought for that so many of our military fought for. And um, I pretty much lost control at that point. I, the emotions just were all, just overwhelmed me, I guess is a better way to put it. I almost felt his pain, you know, because when he was crying for his son, I was immediately thinking of the 4,500. Be happy that you are in, in this <laughs> land. We promise you, because your, your son's defense from this land and killed by terrorists, we will stay in front of them and we will ask him the right of your son and you. other heroes that they lose their <laughs> life. Thank you. Um, would you please tell him that um, I can't always control when the tears will flow, but I know that my son is with God and that someday I will get to see my son again. And this is just part of my journey. We had an opportunity to meet the most wonderful person. Dr. Namam Gafori. Her energy was just so vibrant and her personality just so, just, it was almost to where it drew you in and you became friends with her immediately. Where I come from or why I'm here, it's a long story. But if I tell you that I'm also a child of war, I was born in a cave while my hometown was bombarded. Uh, by airplane. What that tells me, and maybe she has said this, but I had this in the back of my head, death is always chasing them. Later on, uh, I grew up in exile in Iran and later uh, to Sweden. And she went to school there, um, went to college, and became a doctor. I was hoping that I would never ever see the same situation that we had gone through. But unfortunately, 
Um, we have seen it several times since then. At the end of July, in the beginning of August, uh, we heard those horrible news about ISIS attacking uh, Yazidi people. Hundreds of thousands of people who had to escape ISIS and they were trapped on the mountain. We were just, you know, shocked by the dimension of the catastrophe. Because I think at that time nobody had understood how big and how huge was this catastrophe. We are a group, an organization that we want to help our people, uh, independent of religion, if it, they are Christians, you see these poor, whatever, Muslims, everywhere. When uh, we hear about Kubani and the catastrophe uh, there, we do the same thing there as we are doing for our fellow Yazidi people here. She immediately knew she had to come back as well to help. And her first area that she went to with a team of doctors was Kobani, the city of Kobani, which is actually in Syria. The situation there was even worse than here. So people were on the street everywhere. They really needed all kind of help. Although 80% of the city was destroyed and only 20% was left, it was not only half a year war with ISIS, it was four years war in Syria. Don't forget that. It was double war on the Kurdish side. It was the Syrian war and then came ISIS. So the situation there were, was already really, really bad. But when we crossed the border and we entered the Kobani, it was really such an amazing feeling. People would rather go back and live in ruins than stay in a well-built camp in Turkey. Everybody was, you know, doing something, cleaning up and taking away all the dead bodies. We were sleeping in ruins, you know, but people were happy. They want to build it again, to leave it there again. She has been coming back to Kurdistan and volunteering at uh, a camp there near the Syrian-Turkey border, and she is a hero. She's an absolute hero, going into these war-torn places to help people, to perform surgeries for people. I pay uh, the Iranian money, uh, five real, because it was forbidden to speak to Kurdish in school. Oh my God. You got fined for every word you spoke. <laughs> when we got there, the minute the van drove up and we opened the door, out of nowhere was at least 50 to 75 children colorfully dressed, and they just went nuts over us. It was unbelievable. The kids were a beautiful sight to see. When we got to the camp, uh, they just surrounded us and wanting to play, wanting to hold our hands. Uh, they just loved Dr. Kafori. Then they started chanting our names, uh, Matt, 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 Jimmy, Jimmy. These children would follow us around. We, we were, it's like we were Pied Pipers. They had hope still in their eyes. Daesh is so close. Imagine if they come back to Shengal City, 
in just a couple of kilometers, they can attack any time. They did actually uh, an attempt last week. And hundreds of them were killed, and I think around 20 or something of Peshmer we were marching. There. always said that not only religion, whatever you can make use of for getting power, it will be used. You look at Christianity, you look at Jewish, Buddhist, whatever religion you look, they have this aggression in them, part of it, and can be used by a small group that can affect the entire group. My part is just to be myself and to show what I believe. Yes, I believe in God, I believe in Islam, but at the same time, I believe in Yazidi also. Of course, I'm bothered by Muslims who cannot condemn what ISIS is saying. This is what mostly bothering me. Because if they say, is, this is not true Islam, then they have to openly condemn it. There were more than 5,000 uh, women and girls who were uh, captured by ISIS, used as uh, sex slaves. Some of them have been lucky to come back, either by escaping or by being brought back through uh, hidden channels. Most of them, when they come back, they are very really close in the beginning. They don't want to talk. And that's where our role comes. We want to be there whenever they are ready to talk. Most of the time, after several you know, visits and meetings, they start to trust and to tell us the stories. But we have had girls who just hours after reaching this side of the country started to telling us. I never forget this girl. She was uh, raped by the ISIS. So after this raping, he, she needed to stay two days in ICU. 
And after that, the doctor had taken her to his house and raped her in 25 days. Every day, two to four times, every single day. And this is a doctor who is working at this moment that we are talking, free, as a free man, and gets salary from Baghdad. And then this girl was sold nine times after that, was raped by 18 people from different nationalities. And she was brought back. What we give to her or anyone else is whatever we can. And there is some operations that if you ask me in a normal situation, I am against it. But when I know this operation will bring back another life to this girl and future of a 17 years old, I will do it a thousand times. After the operation, first he apologized. I said, why are you apologizing? She said, because I was so um, aggressive and agitated when I was lying in the bed it reminded me of when I was raped. She was hauled by ISIS women, so the other two, three men would rape her one by one. And this had, you know, given her a flashback like that. I said, no, 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 you don't need to, you know, apologize. And then she just, you know, holding the hands and she was chatting and was so happy that we have given her another chance. After half an hour, she really get another mask, another face, you know, really, really sad. And we just asked, why are you so sad? You were so happy, you were laughing, you know. She said, yeah, you repaired what could be repaired, but who is going to repair this and this? How can I go back to what it was? I'd be willing to put this guy's name out there. Who is the doctor in Baghdad? Oh yeah, no, no. I don't mind actually to put it. How it will affect me? I don't know because I always try to pick and take the positive and the good part of everything. Before I'm thinking about the negative, I always try to believe in the positive. And then when sometimes it can the other way, I would say, okay, that was an experience and leave it behind. And I think by moving ahead, this is the best way to, you know, recharge yourself, to get more strength. And every time I can help a single individual, it gives me motivation for, you know, doing for the more. Look, look, look. ولحد الآن يعني اللوحات هي مو فقط مجرد إنه تاريخ مستقبلا راح يتحدث عن الموضوع صح هو التاريخ راح يتحدث على القصة ولكن لحد الآن يعني هو معاصر عندهم لحد الآن أنا ذاك اليوم فرحت من شفت في بغداد مرفوع لوحاتي مطبوعة مطبوعة ومرفوعة في المظاهرات ويطالبون حقوق المخطوفات الجديات في لوحاتي في أعمالي أكيد أنا كل لوحة عندي تقصد تاريخ وكل لوحة عندي تقصد معاناة كرسالة اليوم من الأيام ولكن الرسالة هي ليست إنه اللوحة رسالة إنه تصورت الإعلام أيضا يساعد 
الاعلام ايضا يساعد باللوحات انه اذا صورت اللوحه اذا صورت اللوحه كم صوره وانتشرت هذا يكفي هو هذا يكفي وهم شيء هو رساله تصل انه انت وفلان وغير ناس يشوفوها هذا الشيء كلش مهم انه هذا شاف وفلان شاف بما انه انتشرت اوكي انا حزين انه هو الشيء اللي راح صار بالحضاره و11 دمرت اشياء كثيره ولكن آه هو مرض لابد ان احنا لا نتوقع نترك الحزن ونبدا نستمر نستمر انه نصنع تاريخ اخر This whole thing that we're doing is, is not about religion or politics. It doesn't matter if, if you're Christian, Muslim, Hindu, whatever. This is about human beings. And even all of us on our team are probably all over the map, but at the same time, we're, we're one. We're one unit because we're humans. We have a common goal of helping other humans. And it doesn't matter what their background is. They're, they're children, they're adults, they're, they're just like us. I'm ashamed as, as a human being that we would allow other human beings to go through this. Just because they're different, that doesn't make them less than us. There was a moment in time in the clinic area where the kids were playing. They would come up to me and hand it to me, a picture. Some of it would be houses, some would be of their temple. And I would look at it and I would say, beautiful, this is a nice picture. For me? Me? This is mine? And they would nod, yes. I can't express the feeling that was. I just wanted to hug them all. And I looked at him, I said, you better have a ton of magnets for your refrigerator back home because you're gonna wanna show off each and every one of those. He sat there and I looked at him like he was a proud papa, like these were all his grandkids. But I was thinking though, when I was seeing these, these beautiful children, what's their future like? What's their future really gonna be? Are we gonna let them down? Yes, we can go over there and smile and yes, we can bring them things and make their day a little different. They need a school in that camp. They need schools at all these camps. Education is really a key for all the children. Oh, great. If there was not this great group behind me, I would never be able to do anything. It's not me that is doing this. It's the entire team together. I know that I cannot have any impact on a million. But for me, maybe it's enough to have impact on 10 people. This is not a time that we can afford to turn our backs on these people. We've done that before. They're not all happy with the way the United States has treated them. The amazing thing is that even if the first thing that you heard from some of these people was that statement. After they had said that, then they would invite you to have lunch with them. They would separate America from Americans. They knew we were over there trying to tell a story. And their story partly is about what the United States has or hasn't done for them. This is the time, America. This is a need, and we will regret it if we don't come to the aid of these people. We as an American society, because we have been given much, much is demanded of us. That's where the difference comes in. It's what we all do together. 
If one person can make this kind of difference, then all of us can make an even greater difference. It is a long road. And I think that there is room on that road for all of us to walk, to try to help provide aid, provide care. I got it. To do what we can from a privileged people. My gosh, we're such a privileged nation here. I just want to do more. We watch what's going on in the news, and we, we just turn off, we flip the channel because it, it hurts us. What we can do as individuals is we can actually either privately donate to these organizations, to individuals such as Richard, to assist these refugees, or, you know, be a voice for the voiceless. I had a dear friend who I lost when we started this project, an incredible woman who lost her entire family after she jumped from a boxcar as her family was on their way to be gassed by the Nazis. She said to me countless times, Matthew, we said never again. Never again. Never again that we should allow this as a human to another human. The defining moment for me was being in the room with a Catholic nun, a Muslim heart surgeon, and an agnostic veteran. They're all on a different walk. They all have different paths, but they're all trying to get to the same place. That is a brighter future. And I said, Richard, if the Christians in America or doing what you were doing. Imagine that. I said, leave it to this agnostic to be the most Christ-like out of all the people that I know. Richard definitely is a hero of mine and has really inspired me to dedicate the rest of my life to humanitarian causes. And, uh, and I will. I'm, I'm glad he found me. I'm willing to help as many people as I possibly can, because it's the right thing to do. Our main purpose in life is to help others. And if you can't, don't hurt. I kind of live by that.
you see. 